actually, what the introduction does not tell you about me is that um, I too have a mental illness. I have depression, and I want to make this educational. So I just want you to know that I found this great way of overcoming depression. Whenever I'm depressed or bummed out, go find someone who's really happy, and I suck the life force out of them. <laughs> But I'm tired of the shame and the secrecy that surrounds mental illness. I am just telling everyone. I was coming across the border, and the customs guy asked if I had anything to declare. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I'm crazy. And he's like, oh, big deal. I'm lactose intolerant. <laughs> but the shame, the secrecy goes right into families. I was buying my, my prescription, my medications with my son, Jonathan, when he was six. And he looks up at me with these trusting child eyes, and he says, Daddy, what are those pills? And it was one of those moments that just challenges you to be honest about who you are. So I said, um, son, these are vitamins. <laughs> but then I felt bad, you know, I thought, no, no, I'll tell him the truth. So I told him the truth, I said, uh, son, these pills are for your mom. <laughs> but then I told him the truth. I said, Jonathan, these pills, they help Daddy to be in a good mood. And he thinks about that, and he says, well, Daddy, when you want to feel good, you spend hundreds of dollars on pills. When Mommy wants to feel good, she spends five bucks on chocolate. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if antidepressants came um, you know, in chocolate form? You'd have Toblerone with the creamy Prozac Center. <laughs> Melt in your mouth milk chocolate with serotonin reuptake inhibitors. But the attitudes, the attitudes towards mental illness, and this is what I want to talk to you a little bit about, we recently had a mental health clinic put in in my neighborhood. I live near the PNE. And I thought, this is great. We're going to help more people. It's going to be wonderful. But there was a residence group. They were outraged. They did not want this clinic. This is, this is in 2009. They, did, they were parading around with signs and saying stuff like, these crazy people, these crazy people, they're going to come into our neighborhood and do what? Art therapy? <laughs> I can just see them attacking pedestrians with macaroni and glue sticks. Stay in your homes, there's been an outbreak of collage. <laughs> and I was joking around with these people, and they're like, oh, you think you're so funny, Mr. Stand-Up Comic. Sure, it all starts with finger painting, but pretty soon, they'll be killing people with chainsaws. And I'm like, do you realize how much coordination it takes to use a chainsaw? <laughs> when I'm medicated, I can barely operate a Swiffer. <laughs> and it's hard to kill someone by mopping them to death. You know, the cops are like, hmm, cleanest corpse we've ever seen. Killer must have used lemon pledge. And what these folks don't realize is that as people with mental illness, we are way more afraid of them than they are of us. Okay, put it this way. People with mental illness, we commit 5% of all crime. That means Normal people can be the other 95%. I mean, look at the normal people here tonight. They're polite, well-dressed, gainfully employed. They could snap at any moment. <laughs> when it comes to crime, I feel way safer around some guy who hears voices and thinks he's the supreme ruler of the universe. Put it this way, when you are managing 50 billion galaxies, you are way too busy to steal my car. <laughs> They're like, dude, we travel at light speed. Why would we want your minivan? <laughs> and every time someone with a mental illness commits a crime, you always hear about it in the media. You always hear, and the perpetrator who was mentally ill. I mean, no wonder people are afraid of us. If any other group got mentioned, every time one of their people committed a crime, we'd be scared of them too. And the perpetrator, who was a certified plumber, <laughs> Entered the bank disguised as a sewage pump. <laughs> Said a hostage, the worst part was when he threatened us with his butt crack. <laughs> now I have nightmares every time I open the fridge and see two grapefruits pushed together. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but uh, when, I was, when I was first hospitalized, it was the, um, it was the late 70s. And there was no education around mental illness, nothing. And they didn't even tell me what I had. I was in the psych ward, and then I was out of the psych ward. But the silence said it all. 
The silence said, don't talk about this to anyone. This is a bad thing. And I felt, when I was released from the psych ward, I felt so ashamed of who I was. It was this crippling sense of feeling broken and flawed, and like I was a terrible person and I would never be whole again. I would see people that I knew, previous to my hospitalization, come down the street towards me, and I would run around the corner to hide from them. I did not want to be seen. I would say over and over in my head, I am nothing, I am nobody, I am invisible. And that's how I lived for years. And that's how a lot of people with mental illness live. We are invisible, just don't notice us. And that's why I started Stand Up For Mental Health, which is my program, teaching stand-up comedy to people with mental illness to give these invisible people a voice to give them a way of telling your story so that people actually want to listen. It's great for their self-esteem to succeed at something that most so-called normal people would never want to attempt. And we're changing public perception around what it means to have a mental illness. I see people come to our shows and I hear them say stuff like, oh yeah, there was this guy who was on stage and he had schizophrenia and he was hilarious. And how often do you hear the words hilarious and schizophrenia in the same sentence? And so we have programs, we have programs across Canada. We do, we've done hundreds of shows for all sorts of conferences, conventions. We've done shows for the military, correction services, Canada, where we, people, organizations who want to bring awareness to their people of what people with mental illness are capable of. And our latest initiative, uh, we've been working with an organization called PACE on the downtown each side, east side to teach uh, stand-up comedy to a group of sex trade workers who are an incredibly marginalized group without a voice. So before I leave, I just want to you know, leave you with a few thoughts and then you know, just some things to think about. So the great thing about having a mental illness and being a counselor is that I know all the symptoms. And that makes it really fun to screw around with telemarketers. <laughs> so uh, I recently had a telemarketer call and I thought, I will use the skills I learned as a client in therapy to help me cope with this traumatic situation. So he's like, hello, Mr. Grenier. This is Rick Smith from Great Travel Vacations. How are you today, sir? And I'm like, I'm depressed. I want to die. And he's like, uh, maybe this isn't a good time to call. And I'm like, if you hang up, I'll kill myself. <laughs> No, you should try it. They have no idea what to say to them. Oh, it's so much fun. It's so much fun. Or my other favorite is they call up and they go, Hello, can I talk to the woman of the house? And I'm like, She left me! <laughs> Anyhow, folks, thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate it tonight.